In this session, we will show you some strategies and techniques for removing yourself from the income withholding program for child support, as well as to eliminate or reduce the current income withholding from your paycheck. Let's get started. We will look at the child support income withholding process under the child support program. We'll review the statute, 42 USC 651. We'll look at the history of the program, the creation of it, and the purpose. We'll analyze the federal and the state responsibilities. We we'll look at the legality and the constitutionality of the program itself, and also the enforcement tools for the payment. On the other side of the process, we will look at the employer's responsibility. The employers do have responsibilities. We'll examine the wage and garnishment process. We'll look at the enforcement procedures uh, for your employers. We'll look at the due process rights that you have under the program in relation to your employer. Any objections or challenges that you put forward to your employer is protected. That is, if you are fired because you ask questions of your employer, you can file a lawsuit using 31 USC 3720D. And what that says in summary, if you decide to sue your employer because you were terminated as of questions from child support, the child support program will actually reimburse your legal fees. So let's talk about the, the income withholding. The problem with the income withholding process is that it's based both federal and state jurisdiction on imputed income as opposed to what you can actually earn in your pay. What that does, it's a counterproductive measure and it's very unreasonable. Whereas because the imputed income is set high above what you actually earn, you create what is called arrears. This is what's cruel about the income withholding program. And we'll look further into that. As of 2018, there was a study done by the Orange County Department of Child Support Services that shows that there's over $200 billion nationwide that is either payments or arrears under the income withholding program. So where does that leave us? Well, here in this session, we're going to provide some remedies for having your employer reduce the income withholding, the garnishment, using the Credit Protection Act, as well as if that's unsuccessful to file a lawsuit against your employer. Yes, you can file a lawsuit against your employer. In fact, there's another video on this channel where we show you the five lawsuits that you could start against the child support program. I suggest that you review that video. At the end of this video, we'll have a call to action where we show you some procedures and steps that you could use in order to free yourself from the child support as well as uh, lower your income withholding and stop the garnishment. Hello, my name is Chris. And on this channel, we show you the, the strategies and techniques to free yourself from the child support program. This is our non-lawyer maxim. And basically this states that the information we're gonna provide you in this video will cover certain laws. And that is, we are protecting, protecting both ourselves in that the practice of law cannot be licensed by a state that is Sheriff sure versus Board of Education, as well as we can provide you education on legal strategies. That is, the, an individual can show you or teach you what the law is or what the law says. Here we are now at the income withholding enforcement. Let's start at the beginning. How did this got started? So in 1975, Congress amended the Title IV, which is IV Roman numerals, of the Social Security Act to include what is called enforcement program. This is called the new Part D to authorize the federal funding for the purposes of enforcing the collections of child support. 
and that is found under 42 USC 651 of the Social Security Act. So Title IV, Roman numeral IV, dash, new part D. In 1984, for the first time, income withholding became part of the IVD state requirement plan. They created another section called 466, where it was referred to as the mandatory income withholding enforcement procedure for each state. And they updated that section into 454 of the Social Security Act under what is called 42 USC 666. Again, in 1988, they introduced what is called the immediate income withholding into the family laws of the state. Now, with this provision, they said, whether or not you owe arrears, you will be placed in the income withholding process, and it would be immediate. In 1996, Congress revisited the program one more time, and they added what is called the Federal Parent Locator Service. What that is, is a database. And what happens is your employer will enter your personal information into their database. And it's found under section 454A as part of the 42 USC 654B provision. They also added a few more things. They added that administrative orders can be used for the income withholding. They also require that it's an automated process, which is it's done by computers. So the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement now has the responsibility to provide oversight and technical assistance to the state and their local IDV programs. They implemented that through a process called the TEMPO, that's T-E-P-M-P-O process. We won't go into what the TEMPO is, but one of the key features of the TEMPO program is that attorneys can now issue administrative orders. So think about that. Congress updated the program since 1975 to now give the power to attorneys to issue orders. The single and separate unit under 45 CFR 301. So the Office of Child Support, the Federal Office of Child Support, created what is called a, a group or agency within the Department of Health. That is where it's being administered from. They also created a one state remedy, means that the state that has jurisdiction of the child support case can leverage or utilize that jurisdiction in all 50 states, sort of a one state solution. So when you're summons to court, whether for the first time, you get a sum that says, show up or appear in family court. Well, there's a question here in terms of constitutionality. Congress created the Office of Child Support. That's Article One. Family Court is a division of Article Three. The separation clause of our Constitution says no agency has control of the, of the other. So on the screen, you'll see we have this question mark. How are they able to accomplish this, this work and through the program? Well, what if there is an agreement between the two branches of government? And that agreement is called the IDV agreement or the cooperative arrangements. That's 45 CFR 302.34. This is where the IDV program now creates IDV agencies. And they're now mandated to enter into written agreements, contracts with officials from the court system, as well as the law enforcement, and the prison system. Also, they agree to manage the state IVA program, which is welfare, under 45 CFR 235.70. So now this completes the circle. So this, the Office of Child Support creates the cooperative arrangements which allow them access to the court system through the contracts, and it's managed by the Department of Health. That completes the circle. So where does that leave your constitutionality? When you arrive at court for a hearing and you're in a room with someone in a black robe, at that point, the first statement is, where are you? Are you in Article 1 
or Article 3? That question must be answered because, again, it's the separation of powers. So if you're before an IDV agent, which is a judge that's contracted by the IDV, then that judge or or lawyer or whatever that person is, they're not performing a judicial function. If you disagree with our assessment, please feel free to comment below. Upon further research, we found a case called Blessing versus Freestone. That is, the Supreme Court came back and said, the Title IV-D process or program does not benefit the mother, the child, or anyone. It's basically a federal funding program, and therefore the individual has no rights. It went on further that the IDV uh, process was set up so that the depart the secretary of the state can manage it, the program through the Department of Health or Human Services, that they manage it through your local IDV office, which is functioning inside the court system. Again, that's blessing versus freestone. 45 CFR 303.100. This is now the enforcement of the income withholding from your employer perspective. So here's how it starts. The state would notify your employer of the immediate income withholding. As you recall, where we are now is where the income is immediate based on all the changes in Congress. Here's some of the things to highlight. Once the employer gets the income withholding or the garnishment request, they must return that within seven days. Here's something else. They also get what is called an administrative fee for doing this process. So that means your employer is participating in the program, even if the fee is small. They also must uh, work on the garnishment using the Consumer Protection Act, 15 USC 1673. They also have other provisions that the garnishment income is binding on the employer, um, as well as any uh, should the garnishment should be deducted after state and local tax and federal taxes. That means if you have a 401k or retirement account, paying off the child support is more important than actually funding your retirement. This is one of our issues is that the child support program basically is driving all men into bankruptcy. If you cannot fund your retirement, then how are you going to retire after 20, 30 years? That's why we encourage and we suggest and recommend everyone should be off this program. It is predatory. Next, the employee is required to do what is called submit your name into a new hire directory within 15 days. As you know, that was part of the 1996 changes to the Title IV uh, program. We have a video called Know Your Rights. For a, your employer to just submit your information, private information, to an uh, outside governmental program, well, I think there's an opportunity there for you to question that process. So if you have the opportunity, please watch our video, Know Your Rights. 45 CFR 264.30. This statute says that the state must refer all appropriate individuals in the family to the IDV agency. This is now our assumption. We believe every man in this country is enrolled in the child support program, whether, you, whether or not you have a sibling or an offspring or a child. And this is the statute where it, where it exists. As, as you can recall, they created that database and your employer is now forced to send your information in there. And who establishes paternity? Not the mother, of course, the father. We have a video called Defending Your Rights. Uh, you can view that video to understand what are your rights in terms of submitting your name into, into this database. That's a reality check we feel on our part. 
the administrative wage garnishment. So let's look at the wage and the garnishment process, which is found under 45 CFR 32. There are several provisions to it, but we highlighted three of them that we think you should notice. One is called the debtor's rights. That's fault section 32.4. And in that, you must enter into a written repayment agreement. That means you have to agree to the income withholding. Next is the withholding order. It says that the secretary shall send by first class mail the SF 329A letter, which is the employment uh, notice letter to the employer, a wage garnishments order, a wage garnishment worksheet, and certification within 30 days. The amount that's taken from your check, which falls under 32.8, must be within the Consumer Credit Protection Act guidelines of 1673. And within that guideline, it says that your garnishment should not exceed what is called 30 times minimum wage. And that found under uh, statute 29 CFR 870.10. That is, if you, do, if you perform the calculation yourself and you discover that they're taking more than what is required by statute, that's an opportunity to object, that's an opportunity question. On the left here, we have the form itself. It's called the wage garnishment package. So there's a section called brief inf instructions, so we're gonna highlight that on the screen. Here's what it reads. This is the brief instructions from the packet itself that has the letters. It says the federal agency issues a wage garnishment order and is referred to as a creditor agency. The creditor agency must complete the administrative wage garment form. As I said, it was the SF-329A. So look at this for a second. If someone tells you that child support income withholding is law, they are incorrect. The very packet to the employer state that they are a creditor agency. So, so far, you've now learned that the Child Support Enforcement, Title IV, New Part D, is nothing more than a credit agency. And as the case law, Blessing versus Freestone says, it has nothing to do with the child, the mother, or the father. Note that. So what's the remedy? Well, the, the remedy is you will use the, the Consumer Protection Act uh, to either reduce your income withholding or eliminate from the program. So here we'll briefly state what the uh, Consumer Protection Act is. It is where Congress passed a law that says your garnishment should not be more than 25% of an individual's disposable income, right, 25%. However, Congress, again, inside the child support program, allows up to 60% be deducted from your pay. And as we said, it's after you pay your taxes, it is the first payment made priority. We have a video called Show Me the Money. We go into further details of the of this CCPA uh, for, more, uh, for more information. Please review that. Let's look at the income withholding form itself, the actual form where it's, where it's the order for the income holding. And it's based on what is called imputed income, not earning capacity or, or prior experience. In New York, there's a case law called Kessler versus Kessler. That's from the second apartment, where it says that it's perfectly okay for the child support agency to impute the income and completely ignore the employment history or future. So when you go to court, again, IDV court, and they ask you to bring your tax return, why they ask for that when they don't need it? According to this, the, uh, this court case, it's not needed. So basically they can make up whatever number they have, which explains why the income withholding of itself is so detrimental to all men because they make up the number. It is the beginning of the fraud. We look further into, again, case laws to compare, and the case is called Sage versus United States, where the Supreme Court says, 
the child support agreements are equivalent to interstate contracts and reject the idea that it's anything else but an interstate contract. Reminder, the form itself is a uniform form called the OMB form. It's given to all 50 states to use that form as we just covered. And the idea is to create a one state system which crosses state line, again, interstate contract. That's how U.S. versus says decide this. Not a court order, but an administrative order for payment. Now, who manages all of this? When you go to court or IDV court, it's over, over, the overseer at that point is either the support manager or a quasi-judicial judge or administrator. In New York, as in many of the states, that individual is called a support manager. On the New York law, it's 205.32, where the support manager, which is, a, which is hired by the chief administrative judge in family court, they shall be an attorney admitted to practice law. That's a problem. A debt collection agency, child support, has an attorney sitting and organizing it. That attorney is not a certified public accountant, is not a tax preparer, not a bookkeeper, and not a financial advisor. So you have an attorney who's making decisions on financial instruments, which is imputed, basically make it up. Now, you can sue the support manager. It is our opinion that every support manager can be sued on the 1983 law for violating of your rights because they are practicing without a license. If you can't practice law without a license, how can you practice bookkeeping without a license? It's the same thing. So in fact, it is fraud on the court. You need an expert to do this. And further, if you're going to impute the income, you must have some forensic skills, which means an accounting skills. The support manager is an attorney. Again, that's where the fraud and this is where the lawsuit comes in. So this is one of your remedy. You can sue them under what is called the private parties, uh, the private party act using either ex parte young, but the main case is Owen versus city of independence. So yes, you can sue the support managers. In fact, I believe we believe that you can sue every support manager because they're practicing without a bookkeeping license. So now let's take your employer, which the statute is 45 CFR 303.100. You can also file a lawsuit against them for the income withholding under what same thing, the Third Party Privacy Act under the 1983. The case we you'd reference is Luger versus Edmonton. Now, why would you want to sue your employer? Well, if they're not following the, the CCPA, the Credit Consumer Act, and they're taking out more than they need to, then that of itself becomes a damage. You're saying, oh, my employer is good to me and I don't want to sue them. Well, if you're content with only making 10% of your pay, then I guess it's okay. But if not, here's a remedy. Here's something else to note. The employer gets an administrative fee for performing the income withholding garnishment. So they have a fiduciary reasons for carrying out the program. Again, they're involved in this. They're equally involved in this. So here we've come to the section called call to action. Here's what we suggest and we pr provide information. You need what's called a copy of the Justice Department letter as well as another form called the COL or the Deprivation of Rights letter. You will use that as you engage both the agency as well as your, your employer. So here's what we suggest. Uh, again, you can do whatever you want. We're not legal advisors, but here's what we suggest. You can ask your employee to recalculate your garnishment based on 29 CFR 87.0. Uh, next, you could ask your employee to stop the garnishment. If you feel that it's unjust, again, the income is imputed, use the Consumer Protection Act in which to remove yourself from the program. And if you have any questions on that, please feel free 
uh, to send us an email. Uh, you know, we will tell you what our opinion is on the process. And here's the good thing. You can start this process now. You don't have to wait for the next paycheck. If you think it's unfair, if you think the, the garnishment is too high, you can start the process in which to either reduce the garnishment or stop the garnishment process in its entirety. As always, feel free to reach out to us and we continue to provide research materials for you to use so that you can remove yourself from child support. We also ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We provide what we call information to folks who subscribe outside of our videos. And so you want to be a part of that list. And next, we asked for a $25 uh, gift just to help us with our research. Uh, it's voluntary, but, you know, we ask anyway. And it will help us to give us, to provide more details to you as time goes on, as the program changes. We're recommending here some videos that you can review uh, in order to remove yourself from the child support program. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. We want to thank you. And please review the rest of the videos on this channel.